schemes of, con of controls are not uh, properly developed because corruption. And, uh, and, and, uh, and this sort of, from, when you see from the economic point of view, it's another business, I have to put it that way. But uh, to reinforce law, it, it should be one of the other, uh, I mean, to do, I mean, reinforce law, but to contribute as a citizen to that, that, that law could be applied, it would be a great step in order to, 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 to face these this big problems. It's, uh, it's not so, uh, what I see, the reality and the numbers and the, the areas that are moving, you, you mentioned Soviet, uh, Soviet, the ex-Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, this uh, business is coming now from uh, Eastern countries, uh, sometimes came from Africa, uh, sometimes uh, came from Latin America as well, sometimes came from, uh, from, from Caribbean countries. So the, the, the wave of, of businesses is, is moving all around the world, even in developing countries, even, even in big countries like, uh, East, uh, like uh, Western European countries also. So it's, it's a matter of uh, how enforced law enforcement are applied and uh, how is the action of social surveillance, so, uh, civil society to work on it. I think uh, students should be very committed to, 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 to see very carefully the roots of, 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 of these situations. So uh, what the, every country is doing their own effort, they are doing. Every country is doing the effort, but it's, it's, it's impossible to control organized crime. But why uh, make I, an I, optional like, can, no, can I come in also because I think oh, this Thank is the, a very good question because this is this uh, situation which for me makes my blood boil. Uh, the question of the fact that we have something completely beyond the line which is child pornography and that the reaction to child pornography is optional. So your point is totally valid and I want to now make two or three points for your consideration and for the consideration of Ambassador Luisa Barria and it is because the question is so important that I cut in before Tina could come out with its second question. The first point is that this is like drugs. It is a problem of supply and demand. You cannot, you cannot concentrate only on supply. If there was no demand, there would be no supply. So please do not concentrate on the Soviet bloc and on Africa. They are the suppliers, but they are the suppliers of a demand which you have. In other words, you are the magnet that is creating the enterprise which uh, Ambassador Luisa Barria called an industry. An industry will always uh, appear to fill a vacuum. And the vacuum is being created by our tolerating this concept of child pornography as part of the freedoms. And it amazes me that we have lost our moral fiber so completely that we allow this sort of thing to happen and do not take the type of drastic action which is necessary. There is a chap who gasses part of his population and we go and invade that country and spend a trillion dollars there. But we, we see that our children are being subjected to the same type of human rights violation and we do not take it into the Security Council and take action through the Security Council. The Security Council is the only part of the UN system which has steel claws which can take action. No other, UNICEF cannot, the General Assembly cannot, nobody else can other than the Security Council. And the Security Council has been discussing everything. It has been discussing women, it has been discussing HIV AIDS, it has been discussing poverty, it has been, I mean, it's going out of its way to discuss things. I do not see child pornography on the agenda of the Security Council. And I think it is sad. And so it is people like you, Mothers United, and not just mothers, because everybody in Teaneck should be worried about this, to see whether we can reinsert some moral fiber in the decision-making process of the United Nations and the Security Council. In other words, stop concentrating 
on a limited definition of peace and security and try to create a better world for our children for tomorrow. That is what the Security Council should be doing and it is not doing. And so I agree entirely with you that this concept of just having an optional protocol defies all good sense and certainly all good moral behavior. I hope I've answered your question to your satisfaction. In which case, back to TNEC for your second question. Um, my name is Yuva Zinanli and I'm a freshman global scholar here at FDU. And my question is with um, Secretary General Kim taking charge from Secretary General Anand. Um, how do you anticipate this affecting UNICEF in any way? And how does the idea of reform sit with UNICEF? Will there be any drastic changes with UNICEF? This is in two parts. I'll take part one and we'll hand over part two to Ambassador uh, Louisa Barria. Uh, the Secretary General uh, is really, if you analyze what the Secretary General is under the Charter, he is the Chief Administrative Officer of the United Nations. Full stop. That's Article 97 of the Charter. He has only one other right, which is Article 99, which enables him to appear before the Security Council on a matter which he thinks is a threat to peace and security. These are the two and only two powers of the Secretary General. Unfortunately, the profile of the Secretary General becomes so high that people think that he is the UN. He is not. He is the chief paid employee of the UN. That's all that he is. And so don't give too much credit to the Secretary General. The United Nations in itself is a table with 192 chairs around it. And the strength of the, of the UN is not in the table, but in the members sitting around that table. And so anything that happens which is good is because of the membership. And anything which does not happen and is bad is because of the membership, not because of the Secretary General. So the changeover from Mr. Kofi Annan to Mr. Ban Ki-moon is important in terms of administration, profile, etc. But it is not going to impact the agenda or the action of the United Nations. That agenda and that action is defined by member states and not by the Secretary General. Now the question, the second part was, UNICEF, does, uh, we are all the time talking about reform. Are you also talking about reform in UNICEF? And what type of reform are you interested in doing? Or do you think you are so good that you do not need any reform at all? Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, Ambassador Kamal mentioned clearly it, uh, United Nations is, is our country. So we have the main responsibility to, to fulfill the objectives and the principles of the chart of the United Nations. What the uh, uh, United, United Nations system is doing is trying to, to adapt to the new realities. Um, what I saw in these uh, three months of, 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 of being president of the UNICEF executive board is that the UNICEF is in a process of reorganizational review in order to, to achieve, to do a better work in the countries that are providing assistance. They are, they are doing, uh, uh, UNICEF is doing a, 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 a logistic uh, action that uh, we can, in order to see tangible, tangible results. And I'm going to give you one simple example. Uh, when we were in, in Peru and visited the, the Amazon area, uh, thanks to the, to the work of UNICEF, the reduction of uh, the disease like hepatitis, hepatitis B has been reduced uh, in, 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 the, in the level of 80% in the last uh, four, uh, six years. So that's a tangible result, and that was made by UNICEF in, with uh, working with the local authorities, working with the social civility, working with communities, 
and involve the community itself. It's quite important.